This morning, amen. amen. Woo, y'all sounding good. Amen. Sounding good. Amen. Sing this. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh. Thank you. 
Thank you for being in the house of the Lord this morning. Isn't it good? If, you're, if you've come as a guest of Westside Baptist Church, I want to say thank you for being here. We appreciate it so very much. You could have gone anywhere, and you chose Westside. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to ask the ushers if they'd come at this time. This is one of the most exciting parts of the service as far as I'm concerned. You say, I want to thank you that participated in the prayer visual, the Friday night evening prayer visual, and the emphasis was praying for one another. And we had a list, and I saw people just, as they walked around the church premises, going down that list, praying for one another. And that was a blessing to me. And I'd come up and peek in and uh, see through the evening, uh, people scattered across the auditorium. And I, I was just blessed. And I went downstairs and sat down at my desk, and, and then I started thinking about this part of the service, Brother Dave. I did. I, and I got excited about being able to tithe. And, and so I, I, pulled, I pulled my checkbook out on Friday night and wrote my tithe check. And I got so excited about that, I almost came up here and took up a love offering. Amen. <laughs> Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. So good to be at Westside this morning. The Lord did bless the other night we came in and prayed. And there were several people. And, and every once in a while I could hear. I mean, everybody wasn't. Some people pray silently and some pray out loud enough just for you to hear and uh, and I could hear some of the petitions going up to the Lord and it just blessed my heart to be in, in an opportunity to, to have prayer around here the other night and I don't know folks that uh, uh, and I hope that uh, we we want to follow the Lord uh, real close this morning what we do because uh, we said this back there and several people agreed it's it's like is the Lord's already moving in here? Uh, it started early, coming in, listening to songs, and and uh, I've had people come up and say things to me already. So uh, you just pray that we go in the right direction. I want William to come around and sing uh, this song right now. This goes along with Friday night and and several of the songs that had been had been on uh, our heart went went this direction. And uh, but I had a particular request. Uh, for him to do this song when we don't know what else to do um, we sing songs like stand still stand still when you don't know what to do the best thing for you to do is stand still and let the Lord work just let him have it he'll, he'll take care of it if we just stand still and get out of the way um, but this song it says fall on my knees that's the title of the song fall on my knees whenever we're in a situation uh, some, some people get angry some people you know, they get frustrated. We need to just fall on our knees and seek God's direction, seek His will. William, sing this song for them. When life gets me down, this world can be a lonely place. I feel 
haunted by those old memories. I want to run away because I am afraid to face the reality. But there's a secret. time we have a need, but I'm also glad that there's coming a day <laughs> when the praying will be over, when the needs will be gone away, no more family problems or financial problems, no more sin problems, <laughs> the first day of forever, folks. <laughs> It'll start and run on. Can you imagine? We can't even get our, imagine, our minds around five minutes of bliss here on this earth. There's so much going on. But the first day of forever, we can't even get our head right. Sing it if y'all would.
We haven't, ha, have we had any fun yet? Amen. Well, I tell you, I like coming to the house of the Lord. Now, this young man that we're going to let come preach here, um, Brother Zach Watson. Now, I've never met Zach until just a few minutes ago, and so he was invited uh, based on what I've heard about him. And so, uh, if it's bad, it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding. I'm sure we're going to be blessed. But uh, I've had a hard time remembering, for some reason, Brother Zach's uh, name. But I'll never forget his wife's name. Because I don't know if you've ever seen the uh, episode on Andy Griffin, where Goober is doing his rendition of Cary Grant. He goes, Julie, 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 Julie. <laughs> So even if I forget Brother Zach's name, I'll remember Julie's name. I promise you that. And it's good to have both of them here this morning. Brother Zach, you come preach for us. The Lord has definitely been, met with us thus far. You come give us what the Lord has given you. And I trust everything's going to be okay. I am thankful to be here this morning, and I guess if this is a flop, you can blame it on Brother Brian Calhoun. How about that? Okay. If you got a Bible, turn to Psalm 116 this morning. Psalm 116. We are thankful for the wonderful choir singing that 
we've heard. I kind of feel like I'm preaching at a Gaither homecoming this morning. <laughs> Amen. Would you stand again this morning to reverence the reading of the Word of God? Will also give us a chance to stretch our legs. I've come to realize in evangelism that it is much more difficult to fall asleep standing up than it is sitting down. And uh, so as we read the first half of this Psalm 116, we'll stand and reverence what's been read. The Bible begins in verse number 1, I love the Lord. Because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death compassed me, the pains of hell yet hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. Aren't you thankful for that? I was brought low, and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I love this bold declaration. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. And then the last verse we'll read will be a great encouragement to each of us. I said in my haste, all men are liars. Amen? You can be seated this morning. As we hear these verses read, and we recognize the account of the psalmist in the dealings his God has had with him in prayer. We can be reminded of a cliche that has been woven into our American culture that many of us have probably used over the course of our lives. The saying goes, God will only help those who help themselves. Many have held this cliche to be Bible truth, but I hate to burst your bubble this morning. This is nowhere found in the Bible, nor is the principle that is the underlying theme of this cliche found anywhere. For if God was seeking after those who could help themselves, He would be seeking after no one. And if we could in some way help ourselves, there would be no need for God. So I can state this morning with a surety, God is always helping the helpless. God is always strengthening the weak and it will be our God who will always save them that are lost. For as the psalmist speaks, if we could set the table, he has in some day experienced death. Verse number 3 of our psalm states that the sorrows of death compassed me and the pains of hell get hold upon me. This hell is the word sheol, which is our word for death and grave. Verse number 8 states that he was dying. He had been crying and he recognized what it was to slip. This is not in our text, but in verse number 15, he states, Precious in the sign of the Lord is the death of his saints. He was bracing for death. 
And surely this morning as we hear this account of the psalmist, you and I can identify with days maybe not at the brink of death, but when we could not help ourselves. Seemingly, we've been backed into the corner by circumstances that were out of our control. Maybe it was sickness. Maybe, as it's been stated, financial problem or family issues. But each and every one of us, if we were to roll back the curtains and find the common denominator that touches and points to each and every one of our lives, it would be that each and every one of us at some point in time have faced troubles that are out of our control. There was a hymn writer by the name of Henry Lyde in 1847 who was dying of tuberculosis and between those coughs that would lead him to an eventual grave, wrote in the last stanza of the last hymn that he wrote, Abide with me, fast falls the eventide. The darkness deepens, Lord, with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless, abide with me. And that is the emphasis of our text this morning. And it should be the emphasis of our lives. For we this morning are helpless. And we must seek the one who can help us. Now I want to explain why we only read the first half of this psalm. Originally when Psalm 116 was Uh, being translated into the English language, you would notice if you had a copy of the Geneva Bible this morning, Psalm 116 would have been broken into two separate psalms. The reason being scholarship using the light that they had in their day separated this psalm because there's two very dominant themes found. And they thought these themes to be so important that they would split the psalm. Of course, we have a finished copy of the Bible in our language and it's sitting in our lap or maybe being held by our hands or in the pew beside of us and we see it as one psalm. But here are the two themes. In the first half of this psalm, we recognize the psalmist speaking of what God has done for him. That goes all the way to verse number 11. And in verses 12 through 19, as you read this psalm, you'll see what the psalmist wants to do in return for what the Lord has done for him. And I must admit this morning, are we okay? This is yes, this is no, this I just showed up on Sunday morning. I'm not as interested this morning in what I can do for him. Ah. But I this morning, based upon the helpless state that I'm in, am more interested in what He can do for me. So let's take this moment that we have together and let's look at these verses as we hear the plight of the psalmist knowing that at some point maybe in the not so distant past he was at death's door. He was facing a helpless circumstance and yet in verse number 1 with fervency He states, I love the Lord. Showing a snapshot of his heart, a heart that was passionate for God, a heart that was enthralled for God, and a heart that was ignited for the things things of God and we this morning as we enter into the house of God all bring baggage don't we and yet we should have this same fervency brother Melvin 
Brother Alton, we should have this same deep-rooted emotion for the Lord that the psalmist had as we enter into His courts with thanksgiving. We should say from our heart and not simply from our lips, I love the Lord. Matthew 22 and verse 37. The ministry of our Savior had taken a term where the Pharisees and the Sadducees were wanting to pigeonhole him. Can I walk around a little while? I lecture. <laughs> they were wanting to question our Savior, the Messiah, into oblivion. And one of the questions that they crafted to try to trip up our Lord... Matthew 22, we know it as that question of what is the greatest of the commandments. And you remember what Jesus said. He said that you're to love the Lord thy God with what? All thy heart, all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Then they were wanting a second one. And of course Jesus said that we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. But that one's as equal to the first because we need to love one another. That shows our love for the Lord. The psalmist instituting a New Testament teaching from our Lord in the Old Testament. It's almost as if God wrote the Bible, isn't it? <laughs> For the psalmist states with the same fervency that was given to the Pharisees and the Sadducees as Jesus answered their question. The psalmist says, just as Jesus instructs you and I, I love the Lord. But there have been many things that have been told to me to do in church. Y'all with me this morning? We okay? I don't want you to get offended this morning. But we've been told many things to do in church over the course of our lives. And there have been those times interwoven in those sermons. Maybe in those Sunday school lessons. Thank you, brother, for Sunday school. And yet we were not given a reason I recognize there's some things we just ought to do. But the psalmist here, and I find this to be quite interesting. He states that he loves the Lord. But he also gives to you and I the reason why he loves the Lord. The Bible shows us, look in the psalm, verse number 1. I love the Lord because... He hath heard my voice and my supplication. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. Number one, we recognize if you're keeping notes that the Lord heard the psalmist. And what makes this so important is this psalmist was in the deepest, darkest days of his life. He was sick at the point of death, thinking as though he had reached the end of days. And what we must recognize as we dive deeply into this text is he did not have modern medicine. Nor was he currently typing out a status on Facebook or giving out a tweet on Twitter so that all of social media could gather in with him and say, Brother, you're having a hard day, but I'm praying for you. 
No, there was very little support system because there was very little communication to the outside world. Can we imagine the limits and maybe the discouragement that he faced? And yet in the face of adversity, he looked toward the heavens and he declared his love for the Lord, for the Lord heard his cry. The Lord heard the psalmist. Verse number 2, we see the picture that is painted for you and I as we wonder what it may look like for the Lord to hear us. I'm thankful that the Hebrew language was written in picture form because oftentimes my handwriting looks like hieroglyphics. Are y'all with me this morning? And in these pictures that are painted for us, as we see those words written, this little phrase, incline the ear, carries the idea of one, I'm about to get excited, who is stooping down with his hand behind the lobe, stretching forth the ear. Did you know this morning, as you bring your petitions to him, There'll not be one word that you'll cry out toward Him as you pray in His name that He'll not catch with an inclined ear. He is stooping down. He is well aware. He wants to know. I'm thankful this morning that the psalmist gives us the picture, Brother Alton, that our Lord, uh, uh, the King of glory, uh, I'm thankful the high judge of heaven, He has His ear inclined to us. He's listening in. And as we report in... (laughs) hear you he said I love the Lord because Lord you've heard me I think about a little story that I heard the little boy who was on his way to bed and his father was following behind him They were getting ready to do their nightly routine of bowing beside the bed and praying, thanking the Lord for the provisions that was made them on the closing of that day. And as they bowed the father beside the son, they began to pray in unison. But there reached a point in that prayer right before the end when the little boy raised his voice real loud and he said, And Lord, I want a red bicycle. That's what he said. Amen. The story goes that the father looked over at the son and said, Son, he said, You do realize that God's not hard of hearing. He said, you prayed normally until you got to that one point of emphasis and you just cried aloud. The little boy looked at his dad with those puppy dog eyes and he said, but daddy, he said, I know grandmother is staying in the room next door to me. (laughs) And if she hears that I want a red bicycle, I'm getting a red bicycle. We laugh because it's true. But if and only if we would approach our God in the same manner. If we would see our God for although we are blessed with great parents and grandparents and great grandparents, our God trumps them all. And as we bow our knee, I believe this morning that we can say with assurity, not only does He hear us, but He can answer our prayer. Jeremiah 33 and verse number 3 said, Call call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. I love how Psalm 65 and verse number 2 characterizes our God. 
The psalmist says, O thou that hearest prayer. And yet all of this praying is on the backdrop of the darkest days of the psalmist's life. Look at verse number 3. I just try to walk through the text. He states, The sorrows of death compassed me. And the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. This trouble and this sorrow that the psalmist has found paints the picture for you and I this morning of ropes or cords. For this word sorrow and this word trouble can uh, be synonymous for ropes or cords that are in a particular position. What position, preacher? Cords or ropes that are used to tie one up or tie one down or one that's used to maybe tie to something and drag it for a distance. I wonder this morning if there may be in the not too distant have been circumstances that have come your way and you found within them those cords that seemingly tied you up and tied you down and make you feel as though you're being drugged all around. I just don't know what I'm going to do, preacher. I don't know how many times, Brother Alton, I've had to go to pastors along the way and make that very statement, asking that very question, oh Lord, preacher, I just don't know what I'm going to do. I'm the type that will bite my fingernails into the quick. I'll wring my hands till they're worn and sweaty. I may even pull my hair out from occasion to occasion. you know this morning our God who is seated on the throne has never one time bit his fingernails into the quick? Did you know this morning, although we may be looking toward our nation's capital at Washington, D.C., sitting in the White House, and we're wondering, I don't know what's going to happen to our land. I don't know what's going to happen to our nation. It's not what it used to be. And we look at it, and we wonder, and we worry, and we wring our hands. But God's not worried about Washington. He's never had a Maylox moment. Ain't that something? Has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? For before there ever was a was, He was. And He is. And He's coming back. Amen? And yet the psalmist is painting this picture of the plight where he found himself. He was tied up. He was tied down. He was being drugged all around. I just don't know what I'm going to do. Then called I upon the name of the Lord, verse number 4. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. We can take personal application to this this morning because there's something to be said about trials and storms that seem to invade our daily lives. Coming from out of nowhere, there are times that circumstances seem to invade us and all we can do is bow our knee, as the song said as we were opening up service this morning. Did you recognize in the psalm that we do not see a hint of shyness? There's no hesitancy, but with a sense of emergency, the psalmist states, I called upon the name. He's not seeking an eternal salvation as he says, deliver my soul. 
but a temporal salvation. For we could define this phrase as he called out, as he beseeched the Lord, deliver my soul, and spare my life. It could be said like this, Lord, just give me a few more days. Just give me a little more time. I may not make it. There are times in our lives when God will put us in this position so that we will. I don't understand it all. Many times I can't explain it. Oh, I wish I could tell you of the times when it seems as though I couldn't connect the dots. And yet I can say, even today as I'm standing with this brightly colored suit coat on, the Lord hears our cry. We don't deserve it. There's no merit within us that causes it. But we can be thankful that the Lord heard our cry. Number one, the Lord heard the psalmist. But number two, the Lord helped the psalmist. For verse number five shows this. Knowing that as we read it, it may be seemingly... Out of place. There are three words found in verse number five that will help you and I this morning. It's the word gracious. Gracious is the Lord. Righteous. And then he says, yea, our God is merciful. Do we see the three words that will help us? Gracious, righteous, and merciful. Preacher, how do you know unequivocally that the Lord helped the psalmist? You know how you can tell and you don't even have to explain yourself to anyone that the Lord has helped you? When the Lord truly helps you and you have an encounter with His help, you'll leave knowing more about Him. Amen? The psalmist gives three characteristics of God. After God showed himself faithful to the psalmist. Do we see these characteristics? Notice, he said, when I came in contact with God, I was praying, had my knees bowed. There was no hope for me. I was at the brink, at the point of death. I found out the Lord is gracious. The Lord is righteous. And the Lord is merciful. This word gracious means prone to show kindness and that he's willing to do so. Do you know this morning when you come down to the altar, when you pray for the grace of God, that you're not attempting to twist his arm into giving you it? I've heard people do it. Let me go a step further. I've done it myself. Yeah, I have. Lord, if you just do this, I'd do this. Huh? You ever been there? Lord, if you just show me favor, I just need some kindness today. I'll do that. It's like we're giving God some barter that just so tipping the scales in our favor. No, he is. <laughs> but grace, in essence, is not only him prone to show kindness, but that he's willing to do so. This word righteous means that our God will never be brought up on charges of mismanagement. It will always make the right call. Although you may feel as though you can trust people that may be 
very prominent in your life, there's not one that you can trust more than God. For He is righteous. He always does that which is right. And in His holiness, we see His justice. But then we see this word merciful. Meaning sympathetic, tender-hearted, compassionate. We do believe that the Lord is sovereign. But we see in the text that he is not a stoic sovereign. For the scriptures tell us that even in regards to our infirmities, he's touched by them. You may be going through the dark night of the soul this morning. You may as you limped into the congregation today carrying the baggage and the weight of this world. You're wondering if God can truly help you. You've not said it, but you show it by how you're living. Yet he's not stoic, but he is merciful. And he's willing to be sympathetic as he's walked every mile with you if he's in you. The Lord heard the psalmist. The Lord helped the psalmist. Verse number 6, after he states what he learned about God. For there's only some things that will be learned from experience. You know, this morning, we could all take 12 years of seminary. And there's only some things that's going to be taught us when we have to take one to the cemetery. Our Sunday school teacher said this morning, it's when God gets you to that lowest point. Puts his smile. Preacher, I just don't know how they go through that. They just seem to always have the right attitude. Knowing what they're going through, preacher, I would have broke under the pressure many years ago, but they just continue fighting that fight. Could it be that in those dark times that they've learned enough about God to keep the smile on their face as they realize that they are the sheep of his pasture and he is the shepherd. And he's guiding us. We could not have verse number six without verse number five. For as we see the booming doctrinal statement of the psalmist, verse number six states, as we're bringing it home, the Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low and he helped me. This word preserveth is an interesting word. It's the Hebrew word shumar, which was also found in Job's day. And don't get nervous. Everybody talks about Job, and I know he had a hard road. But I must admit, he saw at the end of his days the tenfold God. Even in the midst of. This word preserveth, this word shumar, was that which encompassed Job that the Lord spoke of when he talked about the hedge that was round about Job. Devil, have you considered my servant Job? What God do in his perfect wisdom, he lifted the hedge. I can't believe God would do that. Why would he lift that guard, that hedge? Why would he lift that which he placed around Job that protected him from the wiles of the devil as a shepherd guards sheep? The same reason he did so in the life of the psalmist. Do we see this in the text? The Lord preserveth the simple. I was guarded. I was hedged. But he also said I was brought low. I don't see anywhere in this text where the psalmist did anything that should have caused him this type of discouragement, 
this type of despondency, nor this type of defeat. And did you know this morning there are times in our lives when we'll be tested and tried and it will not be because of wrongdoings we've done? But it's the Lord making us into the image of his son. And as a whittler takes the knife to wood and carves the wood into the beautiful sculpture, he this morning is taking the knife of his wisdom and the water of his word. And you know what he's doing? He's making us into the image of He said, I was brought low. And he helped me. Even in the midst of my despair, he was there. For verse numbers 3 and verses number 8 to deal with the itemized list of the feelings and the emotions that the psalmist experienced. Death had gotten him down had caused him to feel completely helpless. And yet the psalmist states, Lord, you delivered me. You spared me. You came to my rescue. The things in our life may be sent by the devil himself. But they must be allowed by God as they pass his death. Ask. Ask Joseph. Genesis 50 tells us in verse number 20 and 21 what the devil meant for evil. God meant it for good. Preacher, I just don't know what I'm going to do through this. Maybe it's not you doing through this as much as it's God doing through this. For the Lord heard the psalmist. The Lord helped the psalmist. Verse number 7. We're almost finished. We're going to land the plane here in just a moment. He says, Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. Even in our moments of deliverance, when we've made it through the dark night of the soul, chronologically speaking, this morning we hear the psalmist stating that he loves the Lord because the Lord heard him. And not only did the Lord hear me, but the Lord has helped me. And yet, once again, do we see maybe a level of troubling that enters the heart or the soul of the psalmist, for he says, For thou hast delivered my soul. I know what you've done, Lord. He said, Return unto thy rest, O my soul. For the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. There are times, church, we still okay? Why don't y'all in the back? We all right? God will deliver us from the snare of the fowler. And even in the midst of our days when we're seemingly experiencing victory, we'll again revert back to the days of trouble and it will discourage our heart. How many Christians live a defeated life because they live in the past? Oh, this is what happened to me. This is who I was. This is what I experienced. The psalmist said, return unto rest, O oh my soul. It's as if he's speaking to himself. You know, that'd be a good practice for us. I don't know many of you, and y'all don't know me, and you probably think I'm crazy at this point. But there are times when even I have to talk to myself. 
There'll be thoughts that enter my mind about past circumstances and storms and it'll rile me up and it'll cause me to feel those pains of defeat again. And you know what the psalmist said to do? Just talk to yourself. Return unto rest, oh my so, for you know the Lord has dealt bountifully with you, giving you more than you deserve. Is it not Ephesians chapter number 5, that great passage of Scripture in verse number 18, where we like to let everyone know that we're to not be drunk? Amen. Amen. Be not drunk with wine, where is an excess. We hammer that drunkenness, and we should. Amen. He says, be ye filled with the Spirit. But how do we know? The royal telephone. Verse number 19 tells us. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and making melody in your heart to the Lord. There are times when we just have to let ourselves know again not only what we've gone through, but who our God is. For the Lord, I've got to hurry. Heard the psalmist. Helped the psalmist. But he also healed the psalmist. Verse number 8. He said, For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from fall. Reminds me of James chapter 5 and verse 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, but it does not say all. So although we can pray until we're blue in the face, if it's not the will of the Father, it will not occur. And although there are some this morning that will garner great crowds and there'll be lines of people, brother, and they'll walk across the communion table and a nicely dressed man in a suit and tie will take his hand as there are people behind this person in line and he'll hit them in the forehead and they'll fall out in the floor convulsing and they'll tell everybody that God has healed. I don't see that in the Bible, do you? For this much that's mentioned of is not in regards to the one who's praying, but the one in whom they're praying to. And there's no power in me apart from the working of the Holy Ghost that resides within the psalmist states that the Lord heard me, that the Lord helped me, and that the Lord healed me. If you're healed on this side by some extraordinary providence of God, it won't be me who does it, and it won't be you. I felt like I needed to add emphasis to that. Because people think the preacher all the power and the power is found in the word of God our God and in the prayer of God healed helped heard so we go just a few steps further I'll end with this verse number 9 he says I'll walk before the Lord in the land of the living I believed, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are. We hear in verse number 9 the hope that the psalmist had. But before we get to verse number 9, let's look at 10 and 11. For there's honesty portrayed to you and I. He said, I believed, therefore have I. Have I spoken, I was greatly afflicted. This word afflicted means to be crushed. It 
means to be ridiculed. It means to be persecuted. It means to be captured in order that one would do harm. Why was he afflicted? Do we see that in the text? Because he believed. And yet many times, and this is just the honesty of the son. We make statements about our faith as if our faith in God is going to keep us from a lot of trouble. When in all reality, and I want to be an encouragement to you this morning, it'll be your faith that brings about those problems. For salvation is not the subtraction of problems, but it's the addition of God's grace. He said, I believe. It may be your faith in Christ that at some point causes you a job to do. It may be your faith in Christ at some point in our nation's soon-to-be history that will cause you friends that could be likened to the mid-1500s in England under the first Queen Mary. John Rogers walked to the stake and was burned as he quoted Psalm 51. It could be your life that's given because of your faith. The psalmist said with honesty, if any man tell you any other thing, all men are. But I want to leave you with the hope of verse number 9. He said, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Where's the hope found, preacher? The hope found is in the Lord and the Lord alone. Psalm 60 and verse number 11. Give us help from trouble. For vain is the help of man. Psalm 118 and verse 8, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in him. And yet, in Susick, London, in 1847, closing out my sermon this morning, I think of a young man who was birthed into a family who were atheists to the core. The mother and the father were pub owners. They were heavy drinkers and they loved the lucrative business of owning a bar. And so from the ripe young age of birth, y'all with me this morning? These parents who were atheists to the core raised this young man to shake his finger in the face of anyone who proclaimed Christ and Christianity as a true faith. As he grew, God gifted him to work with his hands. And at 15 years of age, he was the apprentice to one of the greatest cabinet makers in all of London. And as he learned this craft, seemingly born with the tools needed to be an expert in this line of work, the master cabinet maker who he was being the apprentice to on a daily basis would come to the young man and ask him this simple question. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? And the young man from birth was taught to cast a deaf ear toward that kind of talk. And oftentimes... And he would shake his finger and say, absolutely not. But John Hyatt was preaching an open-air meeting in Susick, London in 1847. 
And as he thundered the gospel, not having a tent, but just a simple pulpit and the word of God, he was preaching Christ and him crucified. The young man went back after he heard these words as they were working on a job site nearby to the master cabinet maker. He said, tell me something about this man you call Jesus. He said, I could say a lot about it, son. He said, but why don't you come to church with me on Sunday? And it was on that Sunday that Edward Moat, just a 15-year-old boy, stepped out of a pew and bowed in an altar, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. But the story doesn't stop there. For although people knew young Edward for being very good with his hands, a master craftsman from a very young age, they did not know that he had this gift within him as he took pen to paper just two weeks after he was saved, writing these words. My hope is built on Nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. And it took five years for Edward Moat to write, My hope is built, but I'm thankful that he did. For just as much as Edward Moat had hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I do as well. And I don't know what you're facing, but I will say if anyone is telling you to go any other way, you need to be honest with the psalmist and you need to say, all men are liars. And you need to run to the Lord. You need to cry out to Him. Let's stand to our feet as they come with a song. Someone said, Preacher, it's late. It may be later than you think it is. As they come with a song of invitation, as the pastor begins to make his way around, I wonder this morning what you're going through. Not that you would tell me all your problems, but that you would tell the Lord. He's aware. That speaks to his patience, doesn't it? He knows exactly what we're going through, yet he's willing to hear us talk about it again. Help us. Because he hurt us. Would you come? Would you come? Would you come this morning? Search me, oh God.
hope this morning you can all be found in the Lord <laughs> so we're going to sing another verse to give you a chance to take advantage of these wonderful wonderful attributes that God has preserved for his children brother go ahead and sing another verse please oh. 